Welcome to another episode of Conversations. Today we have Lynn Power. Hello and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to chat with you. I'm excited too. And I love, I told you, I love your background. It says you're a beauty. I love it. That is so cute. Yes. This background, not my background. <laughs> my <laughs> my daughter, who's 20, um, did all of these murals. We have this store. We'll get into it all. But, you know, I tell have my me, hair- go ahead, start talking. I have a hair care brand. And then I also launched the store, the Conscious Beauty Collective. This is our fourth iteration of the store. And this time I roped my 20 year old daughter and her boyfriend uh, into working in the store. And my daughter's a really, really talented designer and artist. And so she came in and she was like, oh, I know what we have to do. <laughs> and she just freehand just started. To- she made that. Yes. She did this whole mural. She did it all freehand. Oh my gosh. I thought it was like a, a thing, you know, like the cardboard or the screen thing. No, oh, she painted that all and it's super cute. So now I, I come in and I do my thing and I'm, I'm happy sitting here because it's like, I'm it is stunning. I yes. love that. That is so awesome. She's definitely talented. Are you artistic yes. like that too then? What's that? Are you artistic as oh, well? Oh God, no. <laughs> I, I wish. I really, really wish I was because I really love art and I've tried. I took lessons when I was out of college and it just, my, I don't have the, the visual to the hand court. I just can't. Right. Yeah. My stuff just doesn't look like it's what it, it looks like in my head. It doesn't come out <laughs> that way. Well, you passed it all to her. So she's got it. <laughs> I don't know. I think my husband has a little bit of the gene. You know, my daughter's been doing this really interesting thing. We're going way off topic, but it's- Who cares? <laughs> she's been going deep into Ancestry.com. Okay. Uh, to really go back and look at all of our, try to find our relatives that are like really, you know, yeah no one in my family has really ever done that so she's kind of taken on this role of being the, mm-hmm. the family historian and she found actually that there were several artists in our family I have my oh. great grandfather is that correct yes my great grandfather used to paint Picard China which was like the the White House China like back yeah. in the day in the early 1900s they used to paint the china like by hand um and so he we have a couple of his pieces we found them on oh my gosh how cool is that their names on the china like it's so interesting right like now if somebody worked for a company they you wouldn't sign your own name to it right it's a different time and i think it also reflects the I would say the respect that people had back then for, um, for artists, for talent, for, you know, people that had that creative ability. Now it's like, we have AI, <laughs> you know? It's yeah. Like, yeah. I know. AI is crazy. Game. Yeah. I think that's interesting though, that your daughter got into that ancestry stuff. Cause my oldest son did the same thing and he's so intrigued by it. And I think it's really cool that they're so interested in where they came from and where you came from, you know, and they just want to go back, back, back and just research it all. I think it's so interesting. It is, but it also strikes me that everything is like cyclical, right? Like a couple generations ago, people didn't care so much about that because they were trying to move away from that. Right. And here we are in a society that's become somewhat disconnected because of everything we've been going through, whether it's COVID or just social media, you know, our kids are raised on on social media, so they don't have those same connections to family. And maybe that's what they're looking for. I don't know, but I, I'm glad she's doing it because she's found out all this really interesting stuff about my family, including the fact that we think that my father who's died in 2018, we think that there was like, he had a sibling, um, that was like, illegitimate sibling in his family that we don't, we don't know who they are, but we think, yeah, like, so that's the stuff that people, they used to sweep it under the rug. (laughs) We don't speak about those people. (laughs) Used to sweep it under the rug, but like with DNA tests and all that, you you can find that stuff. Oh my gosh. That's so cool. Anyway. 
Um, yeah. So why is Lynn here? Well, Lynn is, <laughs> has a background in the ad. You're an ad exec and you also have, um, I am a former hairstylist. So I love that you talk about hair and the hair industry and beauty in general. Um, we, we're going to talk about clean beauty. What do you, what is the definition to you of clean beauty? So what I, in my head have decided is that it's not enough to be clean because most clean beauty is specific to formulations. It's right. about not putting toxic stuff in formulations, which by the way, unfortunately in the U S our beauty industry, as you know, 90% of the products that you buy at the mass market have toxic ingredients that are banned in Europe. And yet here we are. Yeah. Using that's things. so crazy. Yeah. Is, so is there's it all the big names too. Like it's, the it is. And it's a little bit what I consider like the new Coke phenomenon, meaning like if you're a huge brand and you try to change your formula that people have loved forever, say your Pantene, you know, yeah, you, you don't really want to do that because people really love what it is. They love the smell. They love the lather. They love all those things. And so, you, you know, I think it's really difficult for these big legacy brands. So what they tend to do is they'll make another skew, right? They'll launch another product that's their natural product or their yes. this product or their that product. But then what happens, and I, I feel like I was guilty of contributing to this issue is it creates so much confusion for consumers because you're literally standing at the shelf and there are all these different versions. Um, and like I said, there's the, the version that's clean and then there's the original version and then there's the one for healthy hair and the one for hydrated hair and the one for... Mm -hmm um, colored hair and the one for volume and it goes on and on. And I just, I just felt as someone who unfortunately contributed to all that working on those brands in, in the advertising industry, it's gotta be simpler, right? You've, there's gotta be products that just do pretty much every, like our product does all that. It's, it's hydrating. It, it's safe for colored treated hair. It's, healthy, you know, gives you healthy hair, it gives you shine, it gives you volume. And you don't have to trade off all those, those questions, because I feel like our, our in not just beauty, I guess you could say the food, like lots of industries, right? They basically use the, the big, big companies use their scale to capitalize on shelf space and squeeze out all the little brands. And that just has created confusion. Oh, so, so I, much. And I get overwhelmed so easy anyway, but you know, it's almost like a joke that you remember when, um, Pert came out and it was just like shampoo and conditioner in one. Everybody's like, ha ha, what a joke, yeah. you know? But now it's like, I think I just want to use Pert. I want to use something <laughs> that I just grab one thing. I know it does everything. No, because right? like you said, you go and you look and there's like stuff for dry hair, stuff for damaged hair, colored hair. And then people are like, well, I have all of those. Is the is it a ploy to get people to buy like 10 different kinds yes. of shampoo? I mean, you only have it one head. hundred percent a ploy because they trick you into thinking you need all this different stuff. And it's not clean, which is where your question started, which is a lot of these products that you can get at the supermarket, at the drugstore, et cetera, are unfortunately laden with toxic ingredients, sulfates, parabens, phthalates, and other stuff. Even your mascara may have formaldehyde in it. Like who wants that? It, yeah. It's crazy. So, you know, we follow EU standards and our formulas, which the EU bans over 1100 ingredients and the U S bans 11. Oh, so wow. It's that, it's that dramatic. So, and we're finally starting to see the U S catching up with the Mocra modernization of cosmetic act and other things like that, but it's taking a long time. And obviously for big brands, it's not so easy. Like I said, for them to just switch out the formula because they also, there's a reason they're cheap because they buy this, you know, sulfates in huge quantities and that's a lot cheaper than buying the alternatives, which are clean. So yeah. it's like these brands aren't really incentivized to change their formulas because it means it would cost more. So they're either going to have to charge more or, or lose money from, you know, their profit margin. So it's, there's lots of, I would say, gravity holding, you know, pulling these brands back from doing the right thing and cleaning up their products. Um, even though customers are asking for that. So 
Anyway, so I like to think of conscious, not clean, because to me, when you're a conscious beauty brand, yes, you have clean formulas, which is important as we've been talking about, and we'll go into health and all that stuff. I mean, I'm such an advocate for knowing what you're putting in and on your body. Right. When you're conscious, a conscious brand, that means that you're thoughtful throughout your whole process. Like we're sustainability minded. We've launched these big refillable bottles. Um, I didn't even realize I'm talking about this, but we haven't even really said I have a hair care brand. <laughs> <laughs> I like, we just launched right in and I just, right. Like, yeah. That's so usually what anyone, happens. <laughs> yeah. So for anyone listening, I have a brand called Masami that I launched in 2020 after spending 30 years in advertising and it's a clean premium hair care brand, salon quality hair care brand. But yeah, obviously, you know, you learn a lot along the way. And one of those things is like, it's not enough to be clean. You really do have to think about your packaging. You have to think about uh, making things as reusable as possible. So we have these big refill bottles. They're huge. Um, they're beautiful. But like the idea is to try to get people to use use those because um, you can just reuse it forever, theoretically. And we have refillable pouches that are less plastic. Mm -hmm. So just really trying to find ways to reduce our plastic impact. And then also we're values-based. I mean, we're PETA vegan certified, we're leaping bunny cruelty-free certified, and we give back a portion of our proceeds to ocean research. So when I think of, you know, brands today, and a lot of brands are like me, small brands are like me. It's more about like holistically our approach to thinking about the products that we're putting out in the world and wanting these products that are good for you and good for the environment and replenishing what we take from the earth. It's like that simple. Mm -hmm. but just do that. You're going to be ahead of a lot of big companies. Right. You know, they don't do that. They don't, right. replenish. they don't, you know, deal with their carbon footprint. They don't try to be as sustainable as, pa as possible. I mean, anyway. Well, there's so, yeah, a big so umbrella, you know, like the, one of the, hair salons that I worked at was a certain type of product salon and Estee Lauder uh, was hovering over it was the umbrella owner. And so it makes you wonder, it makes you wonder, you know, like the prices and stuff like that. It's like what you're, what you're selling things for. It's like, this is shampoo. Why is it $120 for a liter of this shampoo? Like, what is there gold in here? Like, this seems silly. <laughs> what is it that's so, you know, and I don't know what your stuff runs for. I'm not making fun. It's just, if it's not something that is ethical, but that's what you're portraying yourself as, then it's like, then the consumer feels duped. Oh, a hundred percent. So I think it's a lot easier when you're small to be transparent. And, you know, our ingredient list is, is fantastic because we have really, really high quality ingredients. Even like our aloe that we put in our products is organic. Our chemist does her own organic aloe. Like it's literally the highest quality. Cause that's the other thing people don't realize is that Let's let's use aloe as an example. And another brand can have aloe in it, but it may not be a very good quality aloe, just like anything else. You know, I think yeah, as women like maybe collagen is a is one of those things that you know that Buzz there's word. Like collagen yeah. and bad, you know, but there's some that are just derived from not a kind of a dirtier source or not as clean. Mm -hmm. So it does it does matter in terms of your supply chain, your sourcing, where you're getting your ingredients. Uh, our hero ingredient is called Mikabu. It's a Japanese ocean seaweed. And my co-founder, my partner took 10 years to figure the formula out. And then we ended up going to Japan in 2019 and meeting with this family owned seaweed company to check out for ourselves their process their facility, their operation, make sure that they're giving people fair wages, they're wow. harvesting it ethically, that it's clean, that it's, you know, the facility is, and, and they are a food grade company. So it was perfection. And they're also just lovely, lovely Japanese. Right. Hardworking. Just adorable. And we just had a great time, but like, 
it really does help to know what your supply chain actually is. You know what I mean? Instead of buying ingredients kind of sight unseen online yeah. or from supplier, it's like I can speak very confidently that no, we we know that our our macabre powder is fresh, it's ethically sourced, it's all good stuff. So yeah, I think saying that, that it's matter. food grade, like so it, it's very unregulated then usually not yours, but yeah, the yeah. rest of the stuff, it's just a free for all. You just throw anything yeah. out there. You don't have to, the, the, the beauty industry, as you know, is, is notoriously unregulated. So you don't need to even say what's up until hopefully we'll, you know, the, the, the new Mocha laws, but you haven't had to disclose what's in your fragrance if you have a fragrance. So we have a fragrance, but we put on our packaging that it's naturally derived and phthalate free. Mm -hmm. But if you're a big brand with a fragrance, it could have phthalates. It could have all sorts of chemicals in the fragrance. So you could say the rest of your formulation is clean, but your fragrance, you're not disclosing. So that's where it's like some of this greenwashing and lack of transparency kind of comes in because you don't really know as a consumer, it's very hard right. to figure some of this out. Are you guys um, trying to market young people? Or are you trying to convert? Because like, I like suds. And so I felt like when they got the sulfate free, you know, and I'm sitting there trying to scrub and it's like, this isn't working. It's not sudsing. I want my hair to squeak when it's done. You know, are you trying to convert people that are so used to the way things were and get them like, just pay attention to the ingredients, like really start shopping smart because our generation has the funds a little bit more than the younger generation would to really splurge on stuff that so way. Yeah, I find most of our customers are a little older and I think it's for a couple reasons. You're right about the suds and I think that was Breck if I remember correctly, there was a oh, brand. Yes. Like, it smelled so clean. good. Yeah, and <laughs> but that was their whole thing, squeaky clean. And also the hair care industry was guilty of telling people you need to wash twice. Mhm. Mm yeah, the idea of you to, you know, you have to wash it twice to get all the it's like no you don't. But anyway, Again, that was all a marketing ploy to get people to use more products, but there we go. Um, so, yeah, so I, I do think older consumers, they have more discretionary, ugh, they have more discretionary income. They also tend to have worse hair. I mean, and we can all relate to that. I mean, my <laughs> hair, this is post chemo hair and it grew back differently, but like our hair is thinner. We color it. We put it through the ringer. And so our products work really well for anyone with damaged dry hair. So older consumers tend to see the benefit more. On the flip side, younger consumers, to your point, are looking for sustainable options. Right. They're looking for ethically sourced products. The they're environment. Looking... Yeah. So they want all that and they want clean products and they're easier to train to your point about like, okay, our product is a low foaming product. It doesn't give you that massive amount of lather. A younger consumer is fine with that. Yeah. You know, they're using products because they know, oh, that's not really good for you. Whereas it is a little more difficult. I do have older consumers say to me, like, where's all the foam? And I'm like, it does foam. You just have to work a little harder at it because it's natural, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, But it is kind of what we've grown up with and what we're used to. Right. Yeah. It's just breaking that habit, the pattern. Um, so you had cancer. Is that what made you hyper-focus on all the health stuff? Did that really, is that where it started or? It, it didn't start there because I launched my brand in 2020 and then I got breast cancer in 2021. Oh my god! But gosh. luckily my brand is all clean because <laughs> that yeah. would have been helpful to have, you know, a brand. <laughs> that start I over. Like, There's... Yeah, no, but I think it was more just an awareness of what the industry could be and knowing what it was, you know, what the majority of the industry actually is. And then seeing the potential, that's kind of what got me to want to present a better alternative in the market and also sort of atone for my years of promoting products that were not so clean when yeah. I worked in advertising. Um, so yeah, that was kind of where it started. Um, and then when I got breast cancer, 
I had uh, a sta stage three, very aggressive form of cancer called metaplastic cancer. It's very rare. And I had to go through chemo and radiation and surgery and that whole thing. And that even got me more tuned in, as you can imagine, on all sorts of stuff, right? The beauty industry, what we're mm -hmm. putting in and on our bodies, but also food and supplements. And, and funny enough, there's an ingredient or a supplement that is related to my hair care product because it's, it's from the same seaweed that I put in my hair care and it's called Fucoidin. And it's a Japanese supplement. If you do, if you just Google it and look it up, you'll see there's all this research that it's, it's a cancer fighting supplement. So I actually take that every day. Wow. With turkey tail mushroom, mm -hmm. some other stuff um, as a sort of way to keep my cancer from coming back. Cause there's a very high chance it will come back. And so, um, but that I wouldn't have known about that particular supplement if not for my own product um crazy ironic yeah. so it you're is, are you in remission now i mean sort of they don't really like to say that so much um but but yes um i still have a ton of tests and a ton of i mean every three months i have an mri and then i have a ct scan every six months and i still have my port Okay. This is the cancer port. Um, I'm so sorry you're having to go through that, but it is true. Chemo hair is a thing. I had clients that would leave and be going um, through radiation and chemo and they would come back and they're like, what am I supposed to do with this? And it would look like they had a perm, like the, the worst perm you could imagine. You know, it was just like, this is chemo hair. What the heck am I supposed to do with this? What are they supposed to do with this? You know, how do you try and have a conversation about something that you know nothing about. I didn't, I didn't know if that, why it came back the way it did or, you know, and just trying to walk the path with them. Yeah. Did you yeah, have shaving really, your head or did you? I did. Yeah. I was bald for about nine months, which as a hair care founder is a little, a little problematic. Right. Um, yeah, but in a good way, it was also when COVID was going on. So I basically didn't go out and see anyone anyway. Right. Um, right. That was, that was all fine. Um, but yeah, it was really interesting when my hair started growing back. Um, some people that have really thick hair would say that it grew back. Oh, it's almost like the opposite. Mm -hmm. So it would grow back thinner or straight. And then my hair used to be thin and straight and grew back thicker. And if I really let it grow out, it would be curl curly. It would be, which is weird for me. Um, so I actually, I like it short. Um, it's but cute, I also, short. Yeah, thank you. I like it short, but I also am sort of terrified to see what it would actually look like if it did grow out. Cause it would look like, I think it's. <laughs> would look crazy. <laughs> and it's sort of weird, you know, it's like, here I am, I'm 56. I should not have to be dealing with figuring out my hair all over again. Right. Yeah. Uh, but at least look I great. have hair. I'm super happy I have hair. That's, that's, you know. Yeah. Well, so it, does it feel like you, you're getting a second chance, like a new life? Like you're starting all this new stuff after the cancer. I mean, cause you started it before the cancer, but here you are. And now you've got new hair brand and like you, did you change up your skincare? Did you change up everything? I definitely. So one of the things I did is I launched this conscious beauty collective, which is a pop-up store of about 30 indie beauty and wellness brands. And I came up with the idea when I was going through chemo and then we launched in 2022. Um, but I now almost exclusively use skincare from the brands that are part of the CBC because okay. they're really good quality. And I found some amazing, amazing skincare products. Um, and I've noticed that since I switched over to all clean skincare and I got rid of, oh my God, some of the stuff that I had in my cabinet Oh my God, like terrifying. So I was able to wean myself all off of all that and get into all clean stuff. And I think my skin is happier for sure. Like yeah, I, your skin looks great. It does. Yeah. It looks great. So yeah, I, think I think it worked. 
they, they say, I mean, the more, if you really go down the rabbit hole, you know, they say just rinse, rinse water on your face in the morning. You don't, don't need to scrub it, you know, with soap and they, all these different things are coming out now where, or using uh, essential oils, things that are more natural like that. It's, it's slowly emerging, you know, to where you do start second guessing what you're putting, especially with fragrance. I mean, I love a good fragrance. I'm not a bath and body works girl, no offense, bath and body. I just never have been. It was kind of overstimulation, Mm -hmm. but I like stuff to smell good. That lotion that I'm putting on. Me too. Yeah. So it's, it's hard to know that a lot of that stuff is it's, it is, it's going into your largest organ and your skin might just be like, no, I don't want this. Yeah. So sometimes people will say they get like a lot of breakouts or bumps in their scalp. And I'm like, it's probably your sulfates and your shampoo, you know? But yeah, people don't want to hear that, but it is true. It's like, and I think when you start to switch to cleaner products, you do feel like my skin is happier. My hair is happier. Like, you know, it took a little while for me to get my whole family to switch to stuff. Yeah. But now like I have a 22 year old son and he will read the packaging for the products. And there was some body wash that we bought, like, I don't know, six months ago. And he was like, do you know, there's sulfates in this body wash. And I was like, oh, damn, you know, like, but it's great that my kids are getting tuned into that because I think there's just a lot of stuff in our environment that we don't really know the impact. I mean, I just think like so many allergies are on the mm-hmm. rise, right? Like when yeah. I was growing up, I never knew anyone who had peanut allergies or right any of that. And, and now, I say that too. I mean, I'm sure it exist. They existed, but it's like now it's such so, so, it seems so common. Uh huh. Oh, for sure. Yeah. My sister is a teacher and she talks about it all the time. It's like, you can't even have anything in the classroom and yeah, yeah it's, it is, it's nuts. So was there, I, we went back, but I want to ask, was there a breaking point for you as an advertising where you were just like, this is wrong. You guys are <laughs> really trying to scam people. I don't feel comfortable doing this. It, it wasn't that because, um, for the most part, I worked on really amazing brands, you know, um, I mean, we did all the Clinique TV advertising, you know, we did stuff that, but, and also it was a, it was a point in time, you know, when I was working on some of the stuff 10, 20 years ago, we didn't know what we know now. Right. About. Right. Yeah. That's true. Ingredients. We just, it didn't occur to us that there, there were, you know, things in there, So it wasn't so much that, but it was more that I had been running a large global ad agency and we had gone through a very public me too lawsuit and it was painful. And I dealt with that pretty much two years, almost every day. And it just was exhausting. And I just had this, like, I wasn't getting younger and I'm like, you know, do I really need to be dealing with all this bureaucracy and bullshit and just painful stuff as opposed to what I loved doing, which was building brands. Yeah. I wanted to get back to that. And so what better way than to launch your own? Um, yeah, and then that's I, crazy. Like, how did yeah. you do it? How do you just like, Oh, I'm going to make shampoo today. <laughs> like, well, <laughs> in the case of the shampoo, <clears throat> I met my co-founder who'd been working on our formulations for about 10 years. So it wasn't like I just suddenly sorry. There's a little, little, (laughs) I didn't see (laughs) a little gnat anyway. Um, so yeah, so he had been working on our formulations. Um, he's married to a Japanese man named Masa Mm -hmm. and that's how James found our hero ingredient. He would go to Masa's hometown in Atsuchi, Northeast Japan, where they eat the seaweed and you put and DIY it. They grind it up and put it in their hair care and their skin care and whatnot. And they all look like they're 12. Like literally, like you go into this town and you're like, is anyone even older than 20? They look so young. And his mom, Masa's mom looks so young. And anyway, so James had been experimenting, trying to figure out how to make this clean hair care um, formulations. And then when we met, 
he was probably 80% there. And we did a few more tweaks on the formulas. And then we did a lot of consumer testing to make sure that it would work for every hair type and texture mm -hmm. because I wanted to have a product that was yeah. simple, that worked for just about everyone. And I didn't want to have this massive amount of SKUs and options. I'm trying to get away from that as we talked about earlier. So, um, yeah, so that's what we did. And luckily we got such good response that we then came up with our brand name and our, all the rest, all the packaging and our e-com strategy and all that wow. and launched in 2020. I love that. So your other, um, the beauty products and stuff in the pop-up store, does it, does it have a website where it lists all of the the stores within the store or how does that work? Um, yes and no. So I don't really have the bandwidth to, to do a whole another e-commerce site. So what I did is I added a page onto my site, mm -hmm. Love Blossomy for the Conscious Beauty Collective. So you can shop all the brands right from my site, um, discover who's part of it, you know, check them out. We're all what's called DTC businesses, direct to consumer businesses, meaning we all have websites. So okay. um, that makes it somewhat easy because mm -hmm. I can kind of aggregate everything. Um, and that's sort of how we've been doing it. Um, I mean, I keep coming up with more and more things to do. This is <laughs> a challenge because we started with the store and then we were doing influencer boxes and giveaways and events and sampling. And then I was like, you know, we should do a magazine. So I launched a digital magazine. Oh, wow. January, and now we're working on our next edition, which will launch in a couple of weeks. So it's just, you know, the fun thing for me is, is partnering with all these other really great brands and helping each other. We're all teeny tiny. So the more we can help each other grow, the founders are amazing people almost all female founders. I have nothing against guy founders, just not so many of them. And <laughs> just TV. start making some stuff guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, like really, really hardworking, amazing people, generous people who are really trying their best to make amazing products. And are they, work. what is indie when they say indie? Sorry. I know it's naive. Indie, I just don't it just means independent brands. Oh, okay. So are yeah, they all local? To, like, well, we're not so much all local, but we're not most of us are bootstrapped. We don't have like a private equity firm bankrolling us. We don't mm -hmm. have a corporation giving us money. Um, you know, so we're really trying to do it on our own. Um, so that's, you know, when you're supporting an indie brand, the good thing about that is, you know, we're all so focused on the quality of our products and putting the money that we get back into our business that you really are supporting, you know, a th hopefully a thriving ecosystem of small business that our economy needs, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. What are, if you can name them some, a few things that should, people should look out for that are really bad for you in your shampoos. I mean, I don't, yeah. or in products, I should say, not just shampoos because I read food yeah. labels and I know if you can't tell what half of them are, it's probably not good to eat it, but I don't know anything as far as, and I, my hairstylist, I still don't know. Yeah. Well, it's hard and it's hard to stay on top of all the trends because there's always products coming in and out of favor, right? Like something will be billed as bad and then they'll find out, oh, it's not, not actually that bad and vice versa. Yes. So EU has like a watch list where you can see what things that they're kind of like, they put it on like the not so sure. They got their eyes. So sure. <laughs> yeah. We're watching and you. <laughs> and then usually within a year or two, it'll go to one side or the other, you know? Um, so I always say that the top three things are just the easiest to avoid, which are sulfates, phthalates, and parabens. Okay. Sulfates are really an irritant. It's detergent. Not everybody has an issue with sulfates, you know, so if your skin can tolerate it, but it's like, why, why are you putting something harsh that is like a detergent, you know, on your scalp if you don't need to? Um, and some people have really bad reactions to them and breakouts and allergies and whatnot. Um, parabens and phthalates are also not good. You know, these are things that can be endocrine disruptors. Oh, geez. 
which can wreak havoc in your system, um, can have effects on your reproductive system. Your thyroid. Your your thyroid, my thyroid conked out, which is common. Yeah. Uh, so now I take Synthroid and I have friends who are now going through that same thing. And it's likely because I'm a heavy consumer of all this stuff for a long time. Um, so yeah, so that's why you just want to look for products. If you stick to products without those three things, you're going to be 90% of the way there. I thought I had a podcast of probably a year or more ago and she was giving me apps. Like, is it think dirty or there's. Yeah. yeah. There, think dirty is a great one. There's a bunch, but that's a great way. If you don't know, and you want to check out what's in your product, cause you don't want to have to do the research. You can download the app. The other thing you can do is just use chat GPT. You can literally go online, just cut and paste the ingredient list and say to chat GPT, is this, are these clean? Are these ingredients up to EU standards? And it will tell you. AI taking over I the know. world. <laughs> hey, that's great though. It does the hard work for you. And I, cause it is so confusing and there are so many options out there, but just knowing that there are people that are being proactive and like, we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to do stuff that's good for people. Then that's where people can start sourcing their stuff from. I think that's phenomenal. I will definitely have to check out. So tell, yeah, tell people where they can find you, your website and all that good stuff. Yeah. So we're, we're pretty easy to find because we're very active on social. Um, our website is lovemasami.com, L-O-B-E-M-A-S-A-M-I.com. Our social handle is Love Masami Hair everywhere, Facebook, Instagram, Threads, TikTok. Do you so say Twitter? <laughs> I don't. I don't have an Twitter. account with them. Oh, I don't okay. Because it's all so kind anyway, of political. We're everywhere. <laughs> we're everywhere. So you can find us. Um, yeah. So thanks for chatting because this was fun. Oh, it was so fun and so interesting. Honestly, I just have been clueless about it all. After getting out of the industry, I haven't really paid a bunch of attention and I need to, because I want to have. Well, you're you just know. like everyone else though. I mean, we have so many things vying for our attention. It's so hard to stay on top of all this, but well, and we're all about convenience. That's such a, I mean, everybody is just Amazon, Amazon, Amazon. Do you guys sell on Amazon or does it we directly? Do. We do. do we you? sell on Amazon. Yep. I do think as much as people like to hate on Amazon, it is a great platform for small business. You bet. You, know, you can get on there, get your products on there and, you know, be able to connect with a whole audience of people um, affordably. Um, and that's great. Uh, you know, the, the tricky thing about Amazon is just, again, confusion, right? There's so many products that claim to do so many things mm -hmm. trying to wade through finding out, you know, what products you want is not super easy, but no, well, that, I'm glad to get the information out there and I'll put everything in the show notes too. So people will be able to find your site and, um, and yeah, people find the apps, go look at think dirty and all the, and it's EU standards that you're looking for. Correct. Yeah, that's good, yeah. good information to have. I think it's fantastic. And I don't know anybody that hates on Amazon. Nobody I know hates. On Amazon. Really? <laughs> yeah. Nobody I know industry people. It's more like e-commerce people, you know, people like to hate on them, but uh, yeah, I think as a consumer, I mean, I love yeah. Amazon. Right. Yeah. And if, it, if I know that it's easy to get the kind of products that you are making, yeah, you bet. I'm all over that and I can yeah. get it in two days. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. We're prime, you know, eligible. So yeah. Right. Okay. Well, Lynn, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you. you were a wealth of knowledge and it was super fun. And tell your daughter, awesome job on that background. <laughs> I will. She will love that. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much.